If not, I'll just talk louder. My wife says I don't really. Oh, okay. Well, my wife says I don't really need this thing. I got a big mouth. So <laughs> we'll see how that works. <clears throat> uh, we're uh, in our study in the book of Exodus. And uh, so we've uh, uh, talked about how the, uh, the Israelites were placed under bondage here in Egypt and uh, that Moses was born, he was saved as a baby, and placed in the ark uh, of bulrushes, and uh, Pharaoh's daughter drew him out, and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And so for the first 40 years of Moses' life, he was uh, raised as an Egyptian. Uh, he tried to, to help his people out. Maybe he thought of himself as being that deliverer uh, of, uh, of Israel, and so he uh, thought that he would... Um, try to help them out. He, he killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And when that thing was known, uh, he ends up fleeing to Midian. And while he's in Midian, uh, God speaks to him from the burning bush and tells him, I'm going to send you back down into Egypt and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so he doesn't want to go. He makes some excuses initially uh, for why he shouldn't go. There were five excuses that we looked at uh, that Moses makes, but G God convinces him to go and sends Aaron, his brother, uh, to come out and, and join him in this. And so they both come back uh, into Egypt and uh, they perform the signs that God gave them to perform and the people believed. And they went into Pharaoh and they said, God has spoken right to us and God has said uh, that uh, you are to let uh, his people go. Now, Pharaoh doesn't know who Yahweh is. He doesn't know who the Lord is. And he says in verse 2 of chapter 5, well, who is the Lord uh, that I should obey his voice? He's basically Pharaoh's of the opinion that, well, I'm a god here in Egypt, and I'm the ruler of the lone superpower in the world. And who's Yahweh to, to order me to let these slaves go, to let all my manpower go? Who is he? He doesn't have any authority here. Uh, and I don't know who he is, and I'm not going to let him go. And so last week we finished with uh, that uh, Pharaoh then commanded his taskmasters and commanded uh, the, the uh, supervisors over the Israelites uh, that they were not to be given any straw in order to make brick. And so not only have things not gotten better uh, because Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, uh, but uh, things have gotten worse here because now they're not going to receive any straw for brick. He doesn't want them taking the people away from their work. Look at with me in, in Exodus chapter 5. I almost said Moses chapter 5, but it's Exodus chapter 5. Uh, in verse 4, the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them to rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick, as before, let them go and gather straw for themselves. You shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for you are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it. Let them not regard false words. So Pharaoh's response is harsh. Uh, he's not very friendly towards them. He doesn't care uh, about the plight of the people when they say, If we don't do what the Lord says, the Lord is... He's going to strike us with pestilence or the sword. Pharaoh is unconcerned about that. He thinks that, well, they're just lazy. They don't want to work. They want to go a three days journey to, to offer a sacrifice. Now, if they're going a three days journey there and it's a three days journey back and they're going to have a, a day maybe of sacrifice, they're basically asking for a week's vacation. And Pharaoh says, you guys, are, you're just lazy. You don't have enough to do. You're asking this because you don't have enough to do. Well, we'll make sure that you've got enough work to do. Now you'll have to go out and gather uh, your own straw. Um, so he's going to afflict them with more toil and more bondage. Well, that didn't work before, did it? When they were trying to get the Israelites to stop multiplying and they, they put them under enslavement and they put them under toil and hard work, did, did that work? No, they, they kept multiplying, didn't they? So it, it didn't work before, but we're going to try this uh, again, right? And what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. I saw that as a Cleveland Browns fan, the definition of insanity, right? Because they kept doing the same things over and over again and it didn't work, right? And so, but they kept doing it. And so that's, that's what they're doing here. So they're, they're telling them they've got to go out and gather their own uh, straw. Now, 
Making bricks was, uh, was a difficult task. Typically what they would do is they would get water from a pool and they would bring it over to this mud pit and they would mix the water and the mud together. They'd put it in this wooden form uh, and let that dry in the sun and it would bake and it would make brick. And the straw was necessary because depending on what kind of mud you had, if the mud didn't have enough clay in it, uh, then that straw would, would work and it would function as a binding agent to help hold all of that together. And so the straw had a purpose if you didn't have enough clay in your mud. If you had too much clay in your mud, when your uh, bricks, when your bakes bricked, when your bricks baked, right, they, uh, they would maybe sometimes crack or they would warp if there was too much clay. And so the straw would help with that as well. And so the straw was used uh, in making a bricks so that no matter whether your mud had too much clay or not enough clay, uh, that you still ended up uh, making bricks that were usable for them for these various different building projects. Now, if you remember back to the beginning of this, and those of you that have been with us uh, since, uh, since the beginning of July in this class, uh, we, we talked about how they were building the, the store cities of Pithom and Ramses uh, for the Pharaoh. That's what they were uh, enslaved uh, to do. That was what they were building. Well, what's interesting is that while they're building these store cities of Pithom and Ramses and they're making these bricks, uh, these, there were granaries there that were constructed of brick manufactured from clay and straw. Uh, when Moses began to make demands upon the Pharaoh, the king withheld the straw. Striking archaeological confirmation has been unearthed concerning excavations at Pithom and Ramses. Well-known expert Dr. James Kelso writes, the first was a military depot on the Sinai frontier. It has been excavated and found to contain underground silos for the storage of grain for the army. The bricks found in some of these pits fit exactly the biblical description. Some made with straw, some with stubble, and some without any vegetable matter whatsoever. And so the archeological record kind of confirms what's going on here that here they're not giving any straw for their bricks, but they're, they're not to diminish their quota of bricks. They're still, they still have to have the same number of bricks uh, at the end of the day. And so it matches, what we see in archaeology matches what the, what the biblical record uh, is. And so he just uh, thinks that they are idle, that they are uh, wanting to, to be lazy, they're not wanting to work, and so they're wanting to go and, and do this. And so you've got two different groups of people here. It mentions the taskmasters and, the off, and their officers. Uh, these taskmasters would be Egyptians that are in charge of the slaves. The officers would be Israelites who are kind of supervisors and supervising the work under the authority of the taskmasters. And so you got two different groups of people here that are being told, you go tell the people that they're not getting any straw, that they're gonna to have to gather their own straw. And so however much time they're spending in making bricks, well now they've gotta they got to work overtime, right? They kinda of have to do double duty because they're gonna to have to find the straw first uh, and then get in the pits and make the bricks. The taskmasters of the people and their officers in verse 10 went out and spoke to the people saying, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Notice the parallel there. Go back to verse 1. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord. Well, here's Pharaoh's response. Thus says Pharaoh. Right? He's not listening to what the Lord says. Uh, he's uh, got his own uh, authority here in Egypt. And thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourself straw where you can find it, yet none of your work shall, will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. So we got the announcement, right? That Pharaoh has said, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to get straw. So now these taskmasters, they are announcing this to the people. And we're going to see that it's repeated four times here in the text, this fact that they're not given any straw, that they're going to have to go out and find their own. And so they go out and they try to find stubble, right? The little stubble that's left. Well, that's Maybe not going to help as much, but it'll give them some vegetable matter uh, to put in those bricks. The taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Also, the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? So you got the taskmasters who were the Egyptians, you got the officers who were Israelites, uh, who have been put in charge and they're saying, you're not fulfilling your, your tally of bricks. You need, to get, you need to get busy. You need to get after it. Because uh, your, your brick quota is, is down for the last two days. And so they are actually beating uh, the officers, which the officers probably uh, aren't particularly used to. 
but uh, they're, the people are used to it. The people are under this hard bondage. And so it's really kind of unreasonable, right, what Pharaoh is asking for them to, to do. But Pharaoh doesn't care uh, about the plight of the people, obviously. Verse 15, the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And indeed, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. So these Israelite supervisors who were beaten because they didn't fulfill their daily quota of bricks, they've got access to Pharaoh. Pharaoh looks like he's very much involved in micromanaging uh, everything with this particular building project, perhaps, that he's involved with, with everything that's going on. And so these, these Israeli or these Israelite officers, they've got uh, access to Pharaoh to be able to come before him and say, look, you, you want us to make the brick? We're, we're happy to make the brick, right? We'll make the brick for you all day long, but, but the, you're beating us because we're not making enough brick because your servants aren't giving us straw. It's not our fault that our quota is off. It's it's the taskmasters. It's your fault, right? Because we're not getting any straw to make the bricks. And so they're identifying for him uh, the root cause, but Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's not going to accept that he's the root cause of any problems. It's because they're, they're laziness, right? And that's what he says in verse 17. He says, but you are idle, idle. Therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. He's just saying, you could fulfill your quantity of bricks, but you're just, you're just too lazy. You're idle. And because you're idle and you got all this time to, to think about what it is that you want to do, uh, you want to go off and offer a sacrifice to your God. He says, therefore, go now and work, for no straw shall be given you, yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. Again, they want to go, right? The, the Israelites, Moses came to them and said, let us go three days journey so we can offer a sacrifice. Pharaoh says, go ahead and go. Go and get busy making brick. Right? Not going out of Egypt, but go and get busy uh, making more brick. You shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. So the situation for the people, it hasn't gotten any better, right? Moses and Aaron came and they said, the, the Lord has spoken to us and, and he's sent us so that he can deliver us, deliver all of the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. And when they initially go in and they speak to Pharaoh, well, uh, it looks like this has failed that things have gotten more difficult for them. It looks like Pharaoh is winning here. Comments or questions so far? Now, God had told Moses, Pharaoh's not going to let you go right away. So it shouldn't have come as any big surprise to them that Pharaoh didn't let him go right away. So the Israelite officers, they go in and they don't get any satisfaction from Pharaoh. It says in verse 20, Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. They bl bl basically, they're blaming Moses and Aaron. They're saying, Look, you have made things worse for us. Right? We are abhorrent. Basically, we, we stink in Pharaoh's nostrils, right? That, that he can't stand us now. And you put a sword in their hand to kill us. They're, they're going to, to continue to beat us. They're going to they're gonna kill us if we don't supply them with the, the amount of brick, the daily quotas uh, that they're asking for. Now, their life wasn't all that rosy before Moses went in and spoke to Pharaoh. But even though things were bad, things have gotten worse. And sometimes when things get worse, we look back on bad days and we wish that we were back in them, right? <laughs> when they get out into the wilderness and they think that things are worse or that they're suffering or that they have thirst or they have hunger, they're, they're going to want to go back to Egypt. They're going to forget sometimes maybe how bad it was uh, there in Egypt. But they're saying, you know, you've, you've come and you've done this and you've made things worse. And they're saying, let the Lord judge, right? What you've done has made things worse. God's going to judge you for this is basically what they're telling Moses and Aaron. Well, God told Moses and Aaron to go in and do what it is that they did. God's not going to judge them poorly for this. This was expected, that Pharaoh was not going to let them go uh, right away. But the people are upset with Moses and Aaron. So what's Moses' reaction? Well, Moses re returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh. 
For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Moses kind of takes up the complaint of the people, right? Now the people are going to complain to Moses all along the way in the wilderness. Moses is going to go to the Lord on their behalf. But in this particular instance, the people come and they complain to Moses, why have you done this? Let the Lord, you know, judge you for, for what it is that you've done. You've made things worse for us. And Moses says, well, why did you bring me in here if we're just going to make things worse? Didn't understand, right? Didn't get it when God told him, look, Pharaoh's not going to let you go even with a mighty hand. I'm going to have to do all of these, these wonders. And so it, it looks like, and, and God doesn't necessarily give Moses an answer here in chapter 5, but he's, he's going to tell him, look, stick with the plan. Stick with the plan. God's got this, right? This, this is going to be handled. And so what looks like or what is initially a failure or looks to be a failure that he's gone in and he spoke to Pharaoh and things haven't gotten better, they've gotten worse, uh, things are actually going to get better in the, next, uh, in the next try with this. But I think this is a natural thing to do, right? We expect that God's going to do what God's going to do on our timeline. Uh, according to our wants and our desires. When, do, when did the Israelites want to leave Egypt? If they had a choice, if you said, when do you want to leave Egypt? Yesterday. Yesterday, right? R right now, right? We, we don't want to be here any longer, right? We want to get out of here right away. And God says, well, you're going, but you're going to go according to, to my timeline. And sometimes we're the same way, right? When we've got something that's troubling us or we've got something that's bothering us or we've got something that's on our heart and we pray to the Lord, we, we want that instant message, right? We want that instant response. We want that to be taken care of that quick. And sometimes God works on his own time frame, right? God works on his own timetable. And sometimes we've got to be patient. We've got to wait on the Lord. Um, Moses and the Israelites are impatient. They're ready to be gone. And... They expected this uh, to be easy, but God told them it wasn't going to be easy. Uh, God doesn't tell us that when we become Christians, everything will be easy. We'll talk about more, that a little bit more uh, during the, the worship hour. Any comments or questions through chapter 5? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, initially, right, they're, they're coming, they're not asking him, they're, they're making a demand, right? Yahweh says, let my people go. They're making a demand as if this God had any power, and if this God had any power, why are these guys slaves to me? Yeah, from a worldly perspective, right, you're right, Pharaoh looks at it as being, he's the guy that's in charge, right? He's the guy that's in charge in Egypt, and, and you can understand maybe why he would say, well, I don't know who your God is. I'm not letting you go. Now, as things go on and as, as the plagues come, and he, you would think that his eyes would start to realize that this, this Yahweh, this God of the Israelites, he really does have power, right? Because even his own people tell him this is the finger of God during one of the plagues, that this isn't uh, anything that's some sort of magic trick. Well, I think, yeah, I th yeah, he sees it's making it hard on them. He's, he's showing them who's in charge, right? He's showing them who's in charge. Well, you want to you go, you, you say that, you know, this Yahweh, right, is, is making a, a, a command, right? He's making a demand of me to let you go. Well, I'll show you who's in charge, right? You go make brick without straw, right? So that's kind of Pharaoh's uh, reaction to, to a lot of this, is stubbornness and pride. There's a lot of stubbornness and pride with him. Did you have something, Michael? No. Thought I saw your hand move. 
<clears throat> In chapter 6, then, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. So God says, All right, you're going to see now, right? So maybe we look at this first attempt as being a failure. Well, God says, you just watch what's going to happen with Pharaoh. He's going to, with a, it's going to be with a strong hand, right, with a mighty hand. He's going to have to be forced uh, to, to send you out. But notice it says, he says, for with a strong hand he will let them go. With a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. So not only is Pharaoh, it's going to require a strong hand to get Pharaoh to let them go, but once Pharaoh does let them go, he's going to let them go with a strong hand. He's going to say, get out of here. He's going to push, he's going to want them to be gone yesterday. Right When the time comes, uh, he's going to want them to get out of there very quickly. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them and, and give, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. You notice in this section here, verses 2 through 8, uh, he starts off by saying, I am the Lord, there in verse 2, and he ends this by saying, I am the Lord, in verse 8. Those are kind of like bookends here. He bookends what he says here in the middle with, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. And it, he, what he's saying is, I am Yahweh. And you remember back when Moses was at the burning bush and he said, one of his excuses that he made is, well, when I go to the Egyptians or when I go to the Israelites and I say, the, the God of, of Israel has sent me to you, uh, who am I to say has sent me? I don't even know what your name is. And how did God answer him? I am who I am, right? Tell him I am has sent you. And, and when you look at the Hebrew word there for I am, and you look at the Hebrew word for Yahweh, they are very closely related to one another. And if you were going to define Yahweh, what better way to define the word than to say I am? Because there's no better description for God than to say I am. He can always say I am in the past. He can say I am in the present. He'll be able to say I am in the future. But he says he didn't reveal himself by that name to the patriarchs, that they knew him as El Shaddai. They knew him as God Almighty. But now he's revealing himself. He's revealing his personal name to Moses, and he's revealing his personal name to the children of Israel, that they will know who he is. And certainly, when we get to the end of this process here in Egypt, when all the plagues come upon Egypt and Pharaoh finally lets them go, are the Israelites going to know who Yahweh is? Are the Egyptians going to know who Yahweh is? Is the whole world going to know who Yahweh is? So there's a purpose to all of this. Oh, I was just going to mention that, that I am, that was such a sacred word that they didn't even want to say it. Uh, so they said the letters. That would, and basically they were forbidden, which is why in John, Mm -hmm. That was the exact same I am that they were forbidden to say. And that's immediately had a reaction of those uh, Jews picking up stones and were going to stone him. Yeah, he, he was claiming to be deity, right? Oh, yeah, so, so Jesus claims I am. Yeah. Yeah. He, well, he mentions it in eight, chapter 8 and verse 24. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. There's a he there that's italicized because it's a supplied word. It's not there in the Greek. 
So in John chapter 8 and verse 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that Jesus is deity, right, you will die in your sins. And then you're right when, when the, he says that uh, Abraham looked upon my day with joy. And they say, well, have you met Abraham? You're not even 50 years old yet. How do you know Abraham? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they pick up stones to stone because he's claiming to be deity, right? And to the Jews, that was blasphemy. But yes, what we're talking about here, this Yahweh or Jehovah depends on which vowels you choose and how you, how you uh, decide that you're going to pronounce uh, the consonants that are here. This, this word in the Hebrew is basically four letters. It's uh, Y-H-W-H, right? And the vowels have to be supplied. And so whether you pronounce that Jehovah or Yahweh, the, the Jews didn't want to take God's name in vain. And so they went to the umpteenth level with that. And rather than uh, putting Yahweh in the text or putting Jehovah in the text or putting that, what's referred to as the tetragrammaton, that, that four letter name for God, rather than putting that in the text, they just, that's why you see it in all capitals, Lord, L-O-R-D, because that's, that's what they, they put in there. They put Adonai in there instead. And so if you take the vowels from Adonai, that's how you get either Yahweh or Jehovah. So they, they borrowed, they made another name, right? Basically, Jehovah was another name that they made by taking Yahweh and taking the, the vowels from Adonai, which they, they put in that place of that in the text, right? And referred to him as, as the Lord. But he's revealing to them his personal name, right? So he's, he's telling them what it is. And you're going to see this over and over and over again in Scripture, that God's going to over and over and over again remind them of all the things that he's done. When you read through the prophets, he's going to come back and he's going to reference this time period. He's going to say, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord who fed you in the wilderness with manna. I am the Lord who brought forth water from the rock. I am the Lord, right, who defeated your enemies and gave you the land of Canaan. Over and over and over again, he's going to remind them of all the things that he's done, starting from here with what he's going to do to Egypt. And so he's letting them know ahead of time, I am the Lord, right? And here's all the things that I'm going to do for you. And basically, he's going to redeem them as a people. He's going to redeem them from their slavery. They're in slavery here in Egypt. They need redemption. And they need redemption first before they will be God's people. He says, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I've established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, right? That goes back to the promise that God made to Abraham. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, where he says, I'm going to give you the land. You're going to be a great nation. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so he says, I've, I made the covenant with them, right? And they were strangers in the land. I, I swore that I was going to give them the land. He says, I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel. I have remembered my covenant. Now, it's not that God forgot his covenant. God knew that because he told Abraham, your, your folks, you're going to go into a foreign land. You're going to be there for four generations. And in the fourth generation, they shall come out of there. So he told them they were going to be somewhere else. He told them that he was going to call them out at some point, And he was going to give them this land. And so it's not that God forgot the covenant. But when he says he's, God has remembered the covenant, well, that means it's time. On God's timeline, it's time now, right? It wasn't time to give him the land before because in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, he said, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Right? The Amorites were evil people and they needed to be driven out of the land, but God gives them time to repent. He gives them time, right? It shows God's patience and his love that he gives them time to change what it is that they're doing. He says, their iniquity is not yet complete, so I'm not ready to drive them out of the land yet. Well, he gave them 430 years. Right? They're going to be in Egypt. Well, they gave them longer than that, right? Because Abraham doesn't go down into Egypt. Uh, Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob becomes Israel, and he has those children. So it's, you know, we're talking maybe 500 years worth of time that God is patient with the iniquity of the Amorites before he's finally going to drive them out of the land. Sometimes you wonder how long God's going to bear with the iniquity of the Americans right? Uh, before he causes us to be punished and no longer uh, be a world power or something like that. There's no guarantee, right, uh, that, that God's going to continue to protect us as a nation if we continue to, to wander further and further and further away from him. At some point, the iniquity of, of North America may be complete and, and we may, may be overrun by somebody else. 
But it's not time. That's time, right? So he's remembered the covenant. Why? Because it's time. God's, God's ready to move them. So he's heard them. He's remembered the covenant. He says, therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. Right? So they're going to be rescued from bondage. They're going to be bought, bought out or, or brought out of their slavery. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people. In order to be his people, they have to be redeemed. And for us, if we want to be God's people, then we have to be redeemed also. We've got to be bought back from our slavery to sin, and only the blood of Jesus is able to do that. Now, they're going to be redeemed through sacrifices of animals, but those sacrifices of animals are based on the fact that Jesus is going to shed his blood at some point because his blood covers the sins not just under our covenant, but also under the previous covenant. And the Hebrews writer talks about that in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, I believe. Making sense? Comments or questions? I think too often people try to say God is different in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament, but it's always the same. And he was merciful then just like he is now. And I think that's one of the good points about bringing that up, that it wasn't quite time yet. He was giving the people a chance, but it didn't time. And I think it just proves it's the same God, the same always. Yeah. God shows his mercy and his patience with, well, with the Amorites. He shows his patience with those that are in Nineveh, that are the Assyrians, by sending Jonah to go preach to them, right? And he, and he gives them uh, time to repent. And when they do, he relents from the disaster that he was going to bring upon them. He gives Israel time. All right? You look through the book of Judges. I mean, they kept messing up and messing up. And he keeps giving them chance after chance, right? Even when they mess up and, and they should have been destroyed like other nations instead of destroying them because of the sake of the Messiah, he sends them off into Babylonian captivity, right? And then the remnant uh, gets to come back uh, into Israel and they, they rebuild the temple, right? But God is a... Uh, I see Brian looking at me through the window. I didn't bring my little, my little pocket watch, so I, I don't know. I, ten minutes? I got ten minutes? Okay. Yeah, the, the clock's on the back wall in the lobby and I can't see it. Um, <laughs> which is a good thing. There's no clock up here. I just go until I'm finished, right? I usually pop in five minutes before. Okay, okay. All right, so his pop-in's on the five-minute mark. I got it. <laughs> so he's, he's telling them, here's, you know, here's what my name is. So he's revealing his, his name to them, which he hadn't revealed, it looks like, uh, to those, uh, those patriarchs earlier. But he's going, he says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great judgments, right? And now God doesn't have a physical form, but sometimes we're given some physical characteristics, right? He's going to bring them out with a strong hand or with an outstretched arm, and we think about that's representative of the power that God has, right? He, he's going to bring them out. It's going to be powerful the way that he brings them out with great judgments. Well, who's he making judgments against? Making judgments against Egypt, right? Against the Egyptians, but he's also making judgments against the various Egyptian gods through the various plagues. And we'll see that when we get into the plagues, uh, that he's making judgment on all their gods by doing that. And so he's going to, with great judgments, he's going to bring them out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And it says in verse 7, I'll take you as my people, I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brings you out. Right? When he does all the things that he's going to do, there's not going to be any doubt that he's the Lord, that he's God, that he's the one and only, that he's got power. He's got power over nature. He's got power over nations. He's got power over people. It's not going to be any doubt, right, who, who he is by the end of, of, the, of the plagues. He says, I'll bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Now, God's going to give him the land, right? It's a gift. Does that mean that they don't have to do anything? They've got to follow his rules, right? They want the gift of that land. If they want to be able to live there for a long time, they've got to obey his commandments, right? They've got to do what is, and Moses is going to tell them that in the book of Deuteronomy, right? If you do what the Lord says, you'll be blessed. You'll live in this land for a long time. There's blessings and there's cursings, 
right? But if you don't do what the Lord wants, not only do you lose the blessing, but you also get a curse on top of that, right? And the curses get progressively worse the further that they wander away from God. And so, you know, they, they need to do what it is that the Lord wants in order for them to be able to stay in that land. So he says, I'm giving it to them. There's, it's a gift, but there's still something that they've got to do, right? They've got to obey what it is that the Lord's commanded them. They're going to have to go out on the battlefield, aren't they? Well, wait a minute. I thought God's given them the land. Why do they got to go out? Why do they got to march around Jericho for seven days? Well, it's a gift, but they got to reach out and, they, and take it, right? Just like for us, grace and salvation it's a gift from God. But we might have to march around Jericho seven days in order to get it. You made reference to uh, Deuteronomy, and I believe that's Deuteronomy 14. And if you look at that, the first 14 verses are tons of blessings to the people that make God their God, the Lord of the land. And if you, if you look at those blessings, that's what America was the first 200 years. And then as she gets farther and farther away, you can see the curses that would be 15 through 28. The curses come coming more and more on us at that point. So, uh, uh, But I, I know it was originally written for the, the Israelites, but I think that Deuteronomy 14 really uh, points to America. Well, yeah, I mean, it points to any nation, right? Uh, any nation that, uh, that uh, doesn't uh, do what the Lord wants, they're not going to have the Lord's protection. And um, if we want the Lord's protection, then, then we ought to be thinking about how, how to keep that, right? How to get that. And the solution isn't at the ballot box, right? We can talk about politics. We can talk about political parties and how important, you know, this election is or the last election was. Or we can talk about how important, ele and elections are important. But what's more important, right, how do we fix this? We fix this by evangelizing. How did the Christians in the first century fix the problem that they had with Rome persecuting Christians? Well, they didn't lead a rebellion, right? They didn't join some, some, the zealot political party uh, and decide that they were just going to take out as many Roman officials as they could. What did they do? They got busy about spreading the gospel, right? They spread Christianity, and then what happened? Christianity overcame the Roman Empire, right? Christianity survived, the Roman Empire didn't. How are we going to solve the problems that we're in? Making Christians. If we spread the gospel, if we convert people to Christ, the political thing will take care of itself. We need there to do... There could also be a latter-day Jericho without the miraculous part of it that we may not recognize at this point. In other words, there may be a political thing taking place that we don't even recognize or see at this point where it would make Jericho fall. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, if you, if you had told uh, Israel that, um, or if you had told the, Bab you know, if you had told, um, yeah, if you told the Babylonians that at some point, you know, the, the Medes and the Persians were going to overtake you, you know, they'd think that was funny. They told him that the Chaldeans, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, right? Habakkuk complains about how long you're going to let this go on. He says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. They weren't anybody uh, big or important or impressive at that particular point, but he says, I'm raising them up, and they're going to come in, they're going to overthrow you. We might look at some place like North Korea, and I say, North Korea can't defeat us. We got, we got a navy, right? We got a military. We got the Pacific Ocean between us and them. What if God were to say, you know, you need to straighten yourselves out, or the North Koreans are going to come in? God could do it, right? Because it's the equivalent, we see the equivalent of that in the Old Testament, right? That these folks, there weren't really anything until God says, I'm going to use them to punish my people. I'm going to use them to discipline uh, my people. God could have. Yeah. Yeah, he used the Babylonians and, and, you know, Habakkuk says, you're going to use them, they're worse than we are. And God says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of them too, right? Their, their time will come. But uh, God will sort it all out and God knows what he's doing. And our job is to sow the seed. Right? Sow the seed of the kingdom. Our job is to spread the word. If we make Christians, the other things will take care of themselves. Thanks.